What's up, YouTube? You've seen the shirt. You've seen the hat. You know what time it is. It's Wolverine Wednesdays, episode four. That's right, episode four. Um, you know, I have to, once again, before I get the video full on started, I want to give a shout out to my homie 408 Punisher 408 for hooking me up with this dope ass lighting situation. I can see I'm actually blinded right now by the light. It's too much for me, but I, I just, I'm, I'm really thankful. I'm glad to have this. This is, this is really awesome. So thank you again. Um, also want to give a big thank you to Eddie, the comic guy, once again, for hooking me up for my intro screen, my, my thumbnail to my video, uh, Man, bro, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Uh, and you taking an interest in taking, helping me out with my video. So, um, with anyways, without further ado, this is my weekly synopsis. I'm bringing you books seven and eight as introduced in the Wolverine title series, volume two. Uh, and once again, these are some books that I would personally love to have slab. Reason being is issue seven. This one here is actually the first appearance of Hulk in the Wolverine title series. Uh, you know, he makes his first appearance as the Grey Hulk, a.k.a. Mr. Fix-It. And if you guys ain't heard of the Hulk's great alter ego, ego Mr. Joe Fix-It, no worries. We'll get into that in just a bit. Unfortunately, on this issue, for some reason, we don't get uh, that Wolverine gallery, that Wolverine back cover art that I had talked to in the previous, uh, showed you guys in the previous issues. Um, we get this weird ad about Schwinn, which, I mean, a lot of the 90s books were doing that, but still, it's kind of, it's still an awesome book to get slabbed because... We get this early Hulk appearance in the Wolverine title series, and you know, if getting book slabs not your thing. I, I mean, personally, I really want to do it, but that's issue seven. Now, moving on to issue eight, this is the conclusion of that Hulk appearance. Uh, again, awesome, awesome, iconic cover. We got Wolverine and Hulk uh, on the cover here, uh, both wearing tuxes, um, and you know, for. for for some reason, they skipped the Wolverine Gallery in the previous issue, but they did bring it back in this issue uh, with none other than super controversial artist Rob Liefeld. Um, you know, personally, there are times when I like them, and then there's times when I don't. Uh, this actual piece of artwork I like. I think it's a pretty cool Liefeld drawing. Um, like, like I said, I know some people can take them or leave them. He is what he is, you guys, and for better or worse, he made the 90s a lot of what it was, so... Anyways, again, another awesome book to have slab just because we got the back, you know, the wraparound, not really a wraparound cover, but a, a back cover, so you can choose to display it either which way you want. Um, someday, one of these days, I'll get that one slab. But anyways, without further ado, let's get on to the story. Uh, let's check it out. As always, you guys, you know, we got to give credit where credit is due, so let's talk about the fine team that worked on these books. First and foremost, the writer we have Chris Claremont. The artist is John Buscema. Letter is Ken Bruzenak. And as the color for book seven, Mike Rockowitz takes over for this book. Yet in book eight, we get our uh, Glennis Oliver comes back. Uh, Bob Harris is the editor. And as you saw in the previous books, they were having fun with our good buddy, Mr. Tom DeFalco, and listing him as this and that. Um, this one, they have him credited as the consigliere, which actually comes from an old Italian word meaning. Um, meaning advisor to a crime boss. Um, and, and that's pretty funny because, uh, you know, this is a term that's made famous by Martin Scorsese in the, in the, in the Godfather films. And these, these two sets of book kind of have a Godfather feel to them. Like, uh, you know, there's dons and crimes and organized crime and stuff like that going on. So that's pretty funny. Um, and then, uh, in book eight, he's, he's actually billed as your tour guide. So they keep having fun with the, with our buddy, Tom DeFalco. <laughs> Issue 7, Part 1 of 2, titled, Mr. Fix-It Comes to Town. In this book, Mr. Joe Fix-It, who is the Green Hulk's gray alter ego and kind of a lightweight Vegas Mafia man, he comes to Majapur to take out the man responsible for taking out General Koi's opium fields. While Wolverine has his hands full with Hulk, the Prince of Majapur tries to negotiate a truce between Tiger and Koi. As I said before, and I'll say it again, the splash page on this series are just killing it. Um, check out the Great Goliath, known as Mr. Joseph Joe Fix-It, in a badass two-piece oversized mafioso suit with a blue bowler and a tie to match. He has a wise guy smug look on his face. It's, it's freaking awesome, you guys. Um, Fix-It's in the company of an unnamed Don who, in true wise guy style, is using vague and shady yet eloquently phrased terminology to insinuate that he has a job for Mr. Fix-It. 
This really reminds me of a scene out of The Godfather where the Don is going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Not that Fix-It is one on the receiving end of it. Fix is more like a Luca Brasi type of character. You know, he has he has the muscle. And I mean, basically, the two agree that Fix-It will do the job on behalf of the Don. And uh, let's just say he's going to check up on some of the Don's interests. Next, we cut to Madripoor, where our heroes are still very much on edge due to the cliffhanger ending we were left with in the last issue. Wolverine, the pilot Archie Corrigan, former Spider-Woman Jessica Drew, uh, the top crime boss of Madripoor, Tiger Tiger, uh, previous new mutant team member and the niece of General Koi, Karma, and the American actress slash best friend to Jessica Drew, Lindsay McCabe. They had pretty much done taking care of all of General Koi's biggest guns, including the Vampire Bloodsport and the big badass Asgardian Bruiser Roughhouse. Um, so they were getting ready to take care of the general himself. The Prince of Madripoor busts in the room with his armed guards spouting off that he's the one true ruler of Madripoor and he decides who lives and dies. I love how Wolverine takes the time to think that if that's true, we won't go down alone. I'll see to that. The prince may be the ruler of Madripoor, but I'm Wolverine. Another great look into this man's psyche. Simply stated, it doesn't matter the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. You know, this man's entire history has been basically to fight against all odds. You know, and that's why he's one of my favorites. Just then, one of the oddest of things happens. The prince realizes that in this ragtag bunch of heroes is American actress Lindsay McCabe. And he gets starstruck. He confesses that he's a huge fan of Miss McCabe's and he invites her and all of her friends to be guests in the palace. No sooner than General McCoy, or excuse me, that General Coy tries to interject that the prince should crush his enemies instead of entertaining them, the general is shut down and told to know his place. So the gang decides to take the prince for his word and stay as his honored guests. Next, we cut to the desert with a female limo driver known only as Connie stopping a few up. She gets approached by some members of Roughneck Motorcycle Gang, and they do not seem to take the hint that she's not interested in them. Um, she seems to be a pretty tough chick, though, because she ends up tossing one of them on their ass. But that guy gets up and pulls a knife. Just as he's making every threat under the sun to do her harm, the Jolly Gray Giant comes out to fix the situation. He tears those guys and their bikes the F up. Back in Madripoor, Tiger Tiger is pacing in her room back and forth wondering how she's going to get out. She wants to get out of this impenetrable and invulnerable suit that Lindsay stuck her in that nobody sees, seems to know how to get her out of. She wants to get out of her room and out of the castle in order to get back at her enemy, you know, uh, General Koi, and finally dispose of him. Wolverine pulls her out of the room, easily gets her out of the suit, you know, since he's the one that commissions it. And he informs her that the prince has a message and a deal for her. She can continue to be the crime boss of one area of Madripoor while Koi continues to operate side by side and do his whole slave trade and drug or anything. Wolverine pitches it to her as a win-win situation. She eventually takes the deal, but not before she pisses Wolverine off, calling him a lackey to the prince. When she sees she's angered him, she further insults him by saying, Good, I've made you angry. At least you're man enough to feel pride and shame. You know, I don't know about you guys, but th this whole feeling of tenseness and, and, and the way she plays him, I feel like them two have a little more than more than what meets the eye. They have something else going on, but I guess we'll find out later. After Tiger and General Koi agree to the truce in front of the prince, the prince quickly dismisses business and moves on to pleasure. He takes Lindsay into a back room where he shows Lindsay his collection of movies, posters, and even full-size statues of her in various movie roles gets pretty creepy <laughs> and Jessica worries that an autograph may not be all that this crazed fan is after. Man you guys this book is filled with creeper after creeper after creeper. First the guys at the gas station trying to make their unwanted advances on fix its limo driver Connie. Then the pirate prince in his secret shrine room to Hollywood crush Lindsay McCabe. And now Roughhouse comes to Karma's room in a drunken stupor looking to party. Lucky for Karma, Wolverine was there to check on her. After they tag team Roughhouse and take him down, Karma reveals that she's sticking around her uncle because she's holding out hope that General Koi's crime connections will help her find out where her missing brother and sister are. She goes on to say that she's scared for her uncle's life 
as she heard that one of Koi's business partners has hired some muscle to go in and look as to why his opium fields were destroyed. She heard his name is Mr. Fixit and that he makes the Terminator look like a pansy. Patch agrees to look into the situation for karma. I mean, hell, he owes her that much, right? Um, he goes and stakes out the Madripoor airport waiting for Fixit to arrive. When Fixit arrives, he's there with a valet who's there to take his bags and a beautiful limo driver. He seems to prefer pretty female drivers. Um, turns out the valet who was there to take his bags was a decoy, and he was actually there to try and take Mr. Mr. Fix-It down, and he had a whole gang there to help him do it. While the fight's going on, Wolverine lays in the cut and watches the fight go down. He mentions something about this Fix-It guy is very familiar. Wolverine never forgets a scent or a face, even if it's gray instead of green. After watching Fix-It fight, it confirmed it's really the Hulk. With the driver shaken up and fix it in a jam to get to the hotel before sunrise, Wolverine has volunteered to drive the gray guy home. Finally, our thoughts are confirmed. As the sun rises, Wolverine breaks into fix its room and finds none other than Dr. Robert Brooks Banner, sound asleep, swimming in an oversized suit of Mr. Fix-It's. Wolverine has to stop himself from laughing out loud as he promises to make the Hulk pay for stepping foot in his town. And he promises it's gonna be fun. So now let's see what happens in the next issue titled If It Ain't Broke. Don't forget, as a quick side note, unfortunately on this issue we don't get that Wolverine cover art on the back. It's just a regular old Schwinn ad. On to issue 8 titled If It Ain't Broke. For once the little knucklehead uses his brains over his brawn and tricks the Grey Hulk into doing the dirty work for him. He uses his newfound muscle into taking care of all kinds of crime around low time Madripoor. All the while, Wolverine is pulling practical joke after dirty deed on the Hulk, without the Hulk even knowing it. Really ticks the Hulk off, but since he can't really prove Patch has done any of it, he just has to stay angry. And trust me, you guys wouldn't like him when he's angry. And honestly, you guys, this is actually a really, really tough issue to, to give a synopsis about because it's really funny and it's really fun to read. So I hope you guys can get, you know, get your own copy of it or find a way to read it online. But, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to do it justice. Another great splash page featuring a soaking wet and pissed off Hulk wondering where the F are my clothes and you know Patch has something to do with it. Again you guys I just want to say Bushema is a beast. He's really knocking that out of the park with these splash pages. I, I'm, I'm really digging them. So soon we find out that Wolverine has stolen all of the Hulk's clothes while he was in the shower and replaced everything he owns with dozens of pairs of purple pants. I guess that's just a little inside joke to to him calling back to their first fight when the Hulk was wearing purple pants. Uh, Wolverine leaves a note stating, we know who you are, now get out of town. Next, we cut to the princess bar with a scene I originally thought was ripped right out of, off the screen of Casablanca. Even though I've never seen the movie, it just seems like something that would have been in the movie. Then the very next line on the page confirms it. In Casablanca, in the good old days, deals were cut and made in Rick's bar. In Madripoor, it's the princess bar. Really nice artwork, so I, I just had to throw the slide in. We get a little bit of action with the Hulk busting down the door of the princess bar. He says he's there looking for a guy named Patch. And when Wolverine speaks up, the whole bar clears out. Much to the dismay of the gamblers in the house, Patch and Fix-It don't fight. Instead, Patch agrees to help Fix-It find the information and the man that he's looking for. Little does Fix-It know, Patch is really going to use Fix-It's muscle power to clean up the streets of Mondeport. You know, it's really funny because, you know, Wolverine is just playing the Hulk for a fool, but the Hulk doesn't know it yet. Wolverine pretends to warn the Hulk of some oncoming traffic, but when the truck splats Hulk with his sludge staining his suit purple, you know Wolverine really has something to do with it. Next, Wolverine suggests that Hulk get cleaned up, and coincidentally, all Wolverine seems to be able to find for the Grey Giant is a set of purple pants, which Fix-It is not really happy about, stating, purple's just not my color. Tons of action in this next scene. Basically, Patch is using Fix-It to take down an illegal cat house slash slave trade post in Lowtown Madripoor. Patch even pretends he can't fight just to make Fix-It do all of the heavy lifting. Soon, we get the idea that Patch has been trying to shut this place down for a while. As Fix-It takes care of the two gorillas, frees the women, and gets a taste of the fame and glory, a higher level thug approaches Patch and tells him that he's as good as dead for what he's done here tonight. Fix-It not to be outdone by anyone's threats, smashes the building down around the thug's feet. Next, we get to another scene where a groggy Hulk seems to be waking up from what he thinks is a great dream. 
He sees beautiful women all around him, wine, plush pillows. I mean, all in all, this is the makings for a great night. But then he notices that his skin is white and not gray. So now, Patch playing on the rivalry between the Hulk and Bruce Banner has angered the Hulk to no end because Bruce Banner not only spent all day partying, now the Hulk has to pick up the tab and pay the bill. Even any time left to party because it's time to get to work. Hulk is pissed. Wolverine leaves the Hulk on another wild goose chase. While the Hulk is busy trying to pump Patch for information, he questions Logan about knowing him. He feels like he's, he's met him before. Of course, Logan denies it, and he tells him that the info that he's been looking for this whole time is in the temple just ahead of him. Really great dialogue here between the Great Goliath and the Wily Wolverine. I mean, there's some good jokes. There's some good banter. Um, and finally, Wolverine reveals his master plan to yet again ruin another one of Fix-It's uh, suits by crashing the balcony and making Fix-It fall hundreds of stories down below. We cut to a scene where another one of Majapur's head honchos, a thug who directly reports to General Koi, is showing off the contents of his cocaine refinery. Unluckily for him, turns out that Wolverine's master plan was for the Hulk's fall to end as he comes crashing through the roof of this plant in order to break his fall. Fixit makes real quick work of the cocaine refinery and all of the armed guards. Next, he turns his sights on Wolverine, and he's pissed that he's been played for a sucker. Logan, cool and calm as a cucumber, Let's fix it. Know that Patch ain't the only one who's played the Hulk for a fool. Turns out that the Don from the first book was pretending to be a good guy and employ Fix It to take out Tiger Tiger. But Wolverine turned the tables and used Hulk to bring down the General Koi and his entire operation. This keeps Patch and Tiger's hands clean in the eyes of the Pirate Prince. This cripples Koi's operations and it leaves Tiger Tiger as the one and only tri crime boss of Majapur. Both Patch and Fix It are content with that since she doesn't really deal in drugs or the slave trade. Um, you know, in the final cell of this page, not General Coy, not Bloodsport, and not even Roughhouse want any piece of the Hulk as they let him walk off free and clear. In the final two pages, we see Fix It come to terms with being conned, but not before he gives Patch a bone crushing punch to the face. Patch mentions that Fix It didn't pull any punches. So he believes the Fix-It knows that Patch is really Wolverine. Is that complicated? Did that sound weird? <laughs> Anyways, um, Wolverine, however, has one last trick to play on Fix-It. He switches Fix-It's flight at the very last minute from a westbound flight to an eastbound flight straight into the sunrise in order to bring Banner back. And Hulk is pissed at the last minute, but it's too late because Banner's back and there's nothing the Hulk can do about it. Well, you guys, this pretty much brings the Madripoor storyline to a momentary close. While well, we do have some more storylines that take place in Madripoor later on, um, the next two issues will focus on Wolverine's backstory and some early origins. Uh, but we get this final, last, wonderful look at the Wolverine gallery that we missed in issue 7, but came back to us in issue 8 uh, with art by Rob Liefeld on the back cover. Uh, so anyways, with that being said, you guys, this will bring... Uh, episode four to a close thanks for sticking with me and as always until i see you guys next time keep stacking hella comics